It's hard to be what you can't see. Those are the words of Olympic boxer Romla Ali. Romla's an anomaly. Who else can say they've competed as a professional boxer while modeling for Vogue? Who else can say they have escaped a civil war, completed a law degree, represented their country at the Olympics, and had a mural painted of them in their hometown? Who else can say they've lived a life with as much hardship and remained just as positive as Rumler? Rumler didn't have the same start as many of you listening to this podcast. Born in Somalia during the Civil War, she remembers her father pushing her wounded brother in a wheelbarrow in a desperate attempt to find a hospital. Her brother Abdul Qadir was hit by an airstrike while innocently playing in their front garden. After navigating roads filled with empty shells and burning cars, they arrived at a local hospital, but it was too late for her brother. At that moment, it became clear that Rumla and her family could no longer stay in Somalia. The life they used to live no longer existed. At this point, Rumla and her family left the bustling city of Mogadishu and headed towards Mombasa, Kenya. Their journey began in a small van traveling 300 miles towards the Somali coastal town of Kismayo. They were dropped off at an empty coal yard and told to wait for their boat to Kenya. What was supposed to be a pit stop turned out to be much longer. Days turned into weeks, and without any signs of transportation, it became evident that a boat may never arrive. One night, a group of thieves snuck into the coal yard and stole everyone's belongings, including the hard-earned cash that Rumler's parents had saved to travel to the UK. Refusing to give up, her parents managed to borrow enough money to secure their spot on a tiny boat to Mombasa. The only guarantee was that several people would die during the journey. Rumla and her siblings sucked on sugar cubes for comfort, bracing themselves against powerful waves that threatened to capsize their boat at any moment. They eventually arrived in Mombasa, and it was this experience that would shape Rumla's decision to become a UNICEF ambassador and use her platform to promote the protection of children's rights. Months later, and they'd saved enough cash to buy fake Kenyan passports and flights to the UK. After landing in Heathrow Airport, they sought political asylum, citing a risk to life in their home country. They were driven straight to refugee housing in Paddington, where they stayed until their application was processed. Their first home was in a basement of an ugly apartment block, a stark contrast to the beautiful three-story home that Rumler's parents had worked to build in Somalia. Her parents were successful gold merchants. Her father was an intellectual talented in maths and physics, fluent in Italian, and a proud owner of numerous degrees. That life was ripped away from them during the Civil War. Soon, her mum became a housewife and her father a construction worker on a building site. Neither of them complained. They did what they needed to survive. Their neighbours weren't accommodating either. One of the kids in their block would regularly urinate on their welcome mat outside their front door. Unfortunately, this is the story of so many migrants. Faiza, Rumler's older sister, added a few extra years to Rumler's naturalization papers so she could attend reception class and get free school meals with her older siblings. Life in the UK was tough. It's difficult to establish roots when you're forced to move to several different homes. You're bullied for being overweight and you're anxious about finding out that you're different. Rumler found sanctuary in the school library. She loved novels like Pride and Prejudice, another reality from being mercilessly bullied. She recalls finding a popularity chart that had been left on her desk. It had ticks next to the names of the most liked people. Everyone had a tick next to their name. At least one tick next to their name. Except her. It was another reminder that she didn't fit in. It was the same school that she had befriended Danica a pretty Grenadian Jamaican girl that spoke her mind and eloquently stepped up for all the underdogs being bullied. It wasn't much later that Rumler would experience her first taste of racism. On the way back home from her Quran studies class, she was attacked by three teenage boys. Encircling her on their bikes, they ripped off her hijab and pushed her to the ground. The safety pin from her hijab was lodged into her throat. Stamping on her hijab, their muddy footprints turned it from blue to black before cycling off into the distance while she was left to control the bleeding. 
Romla continued to shed more aspects of her identity in an effort to fit in. As she continued to put on weight, her mum began to be more concerned. She asked Pfizer to use the family card to buy Rumler a junior gym membership. And it was there that Rumler began working out with her best friend Danica. She eventually discovered boxer size. Intimidated by the athletic body types, she spent her first class outside, looking through the glass and wishing she had the courage to join. The following week, she pushed past her anxiety and stood at the back. She felt out of place. Her baggy and slightly dated clothes stood out amongst the sea of women wearing matching sports bras and leggings. But she loved the session. Rumler watched her first boxing match on TV with her brother. It was the British boxing legend Emir Khan versus, versus the Cuban Southpaw, Mario Kindelan. Inspired, she began scouring the internet for local boxing gyms. She eventually found the Trinity Center, an old school gym with instructors that operated on a model of tough love. For Ramla, boxing wasn't as fun as boxer size. There was no music, words of encouragement or shiny wooden floors. This place was old school. You could smell the sweat dripping off the people working the bags and see layers of paint slowly peel off the walls due to the high levels of humidity. To date, Rumbler's professional career is flawless. Eight wins, zero losses, and two knockouts. Her current record has been cemented by countless stops and starts and a tough amateur career. Her boxing journey wasn't without its challenges. Concerned family members told her that the sport was not ladylike and that she would have to stop. And for three years, respecting the wishes of her parents, she stopped boxing and sank into a deep depression. However, after an intervention from a proud uncle, her parents warmed to the idea that their daughter could pursue boxing as a career. This time, there was no stopping her. A key turning point in Rumler's boxing career was her decision to represent Somalia on the international stage. There was one major obstacle to Rumler's dreams. She couldn't represent Somalia internationally since there was no boxing federation in Somalia. Turns out boxing had been banned since 1976, by the former dictator Mohamed Barre. You'd think her struggle would be, I don't know, finding a boxing gym, a local trainer, or even managing her general expenses. No, her first hurdle was to reinstate boxing within the entire country. Rumla reached out to the Ministry of Youth and Sports and the Somali Olympic Committee to help her set up an international federation, but she received no response. Even journalists and diplomats ignored her emails. But after weeks spent googling and cold calling, Rumler's husband and trainer Richard found Hassan, a Somali Canadian on Twitter, who seemed well connected and had even written a book about his life in Somalia. Hassan was inspired by Rumler's story, and he agreed to connect her to a reputable journalist, Jamal Osman, who had built a platform for Somali news, and that platform was called Dilsur TV. Like Rumler, Jamal was a refugee when he arrived in the UK. He wanted to use his platform and connections as a journalist to celebrate the achievements of fellow Somalis. Rumla and Richard faced several challenges in establishing a boxing federation in Somalia. An Olympic licensed coach would need to support her application, and the federation needed a coach. They had neither. Even though Richard was already licensed as a UK boxing coach, he needed an Olympic coaching license. The path to getting this license is fraught with politics. He needed to be nominated by a country's boxing federation, but Somalia didn't have one. And even if Richard got the blessing of the UK to work under an Olympic license, he would have to complete a 10-day grueling course of which most people fail. There was no guarantee that he would be nominated by a coach from an English-speaking country, and therefore he may be examined in another language. The thing is, they were turned away by UK coaches. But they refused to give up. They got lucky. A coach from Malta had offered to nominate Richard. Seizing the massive opportunity, Richard managed to pass the course. He could now officially coach Rumla in Somalia. Receiving an Olympic boxing license allowed him to support the application for Somalia to establish its own boxing federation. 
Excited about Richard's news combined with endorphins from a hard training session, Rumla was ready to share her story with Jamal. This time, she was sharing her story with an entire nation instead of keeping her passion a secret. It was that interview that led a proud uncle to convince her mum that Rumla's boxing journey was worth pursuing. And after a heart-to-heart with her mum, she had her family's full backing. Nothing could stand in her way. And since then, Rumla's represented Somalia at the Olympic Games. She's knocked out women on some of the world's largest stages like Madison Square Gardens. And she recently made history, taking part in the first professional women's boxing match in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. When she's not inside the ring, she can be found modeling, gracing the cover of Vogue magazine and acting as a global ambassador for Cartier. The same designer bags that Rumley used to spend hours admiring while window shopping became the very items she was being paid to wear. What I love about Rumla is that she's an activist in the truest sense of the word. She's used her platform to put others first. She's also the founder of Sisters Club, a safe space for women with and without hijabs to train, allowing them to build a sense of esteem and community. Her club provides self-defense classes for survivors of sexual abuse. And when Rumla first put her boxing gloves on, there were hardly any women in boxing gyms, let alone Muslim Somali refugees. Rumla's impact can be felt across the world, but her light shines brightest in her hometown of Bethnal Green. You see, East London is now home to a huge mural of Rumla, installed by Numbi Arts, a local non-profit. She was visibly touched by their work and she had this to say. By having someone like me planted on a wall in an area that's being gentrified every day and having the community that was brought up here raised here, slowly pushed out. It's great having someone like me on the wall because then it allows young girls that look like me to be able to dream big. And Numbi Arts' cultural director, Nimsa, had this to say, that's why we chose that image, because this culture is proud of who she is and where she comes from, from Bethnal Green to Somalia. Rumla's also a UK ambassador for UNICEF, And in 2019, she traveled to a refugee camp in Jordan, where she held free boxing classes for young refugee girls who had fled from the conflict in Syria. If you've made it this far into the episode, then thanks for listening. And I'd like to close this episode with a few lessons from Romla's journey. I found a couple of them while reading her book, Not Without a Fight. Number one, understand your trauma. Once Rumla understood how her life experiences had shaped her personality, she was able to overcome some of her fears and insecurities, and she was able to use those experiences to help others. Number two, give back. Rumla remembers the generosity that was shown to her and her family in the form of coaches, mentors, charities, and friends. She knows that paying those blessings forward leads to a more fulfilling life. Number three, learn to listen. Learning to accept constructive criticism will be a game changer for your development, especially when that advice helps you to avoid getting punched in the face. Number five, leave your comfort zone. Rumler was forced to take risks and push through discomfort. Boxing didn't come naturally to her, but she loved it. She refused to be intimidated by the fact that very few people looked like her in boxing gyms. Number six, dream out aloud. Once Rumbler made her ambitions known, she found people willing to support her dreams. And number seven, learn the boring bits. This is an important one, by the way. Glamorous goals aren't achieved with anything special other than, I guess, mastering mundane details. Her journey to represent Somalia involved budgeting, hours spent emailing, and general life admin. Rumla's impact is far more than being just a source of inspiration. She's opened the door for so many communities to take up boxing. She's provided the blueprint for navigating the disappointment of your parents, settling into a new country, overcoming bullying, and even creating your own boxing federation, 
and today Romulus stands tall as a local hero. The internationally respected boxer features in campaigns for Vogue while continuing to expand Sisters Club, a movement that makes boxing a sport more accessible. Accessible to so many different people, accessible to women with and without hijabs. It turns boxing into something of a healing experience for people that have gone through forms of abuse and, and trauma. It turns boxing into something of a adhesive, bringing different communities together that otherwise wouldn't mix. It turns boxing into a source of pride. And she has used her experience, her traumas, her fears, her insecurities to build something beautiful. And that's Rumler's impact. So thanks for listening. And for more stories like Rumler's, subscribe to this podcast. Share it with friends. Um, you know, if you liked it, then take a screenshot and tag me on social media. And as always, all show notes will be in the description. Thanks for listening.